um, here to present uh, my work in partnership with Iorenka Tassolenzi Institute, which is an organization uh, in Acre, in the Amazon. Um, this work is also part of uh, a work that we are doing together with a um, working group we created in Brazil, composed by indigenous and non-indigenous people to provide guidelines and act on the ethical, legal and social implications surrounding the research, the commerce, the therapeutics of uh, what modern science calls psychedelics, but indigenous people uh, call sacred medicine. So amid the surge of what has been called the psychedelic renaissance, including the boom in ayahuasca retreats, there is an accelerating interest from major pharmaceuticals and the global market in the essence and genetic makeup of indigenous medicines and also in their knowledge. And because of this, we uh, in, in at Yorenka Institute, we decided to create a multidisciplinary working group to work on issues related to um, all this move from the pharmaceuticals and what has been called the psychedelic renaissance. So my talk will be based on the global expansion of ayahuasca, highlighting the critical role of indigenous groups in sharing their traditional knowledge recognizing their knowledge contribution. And I will also propose a framework in the end that it's actually being implemented and proposed as part of this work uh, within this multidisciplinary working group to better protect uh, indigenous rights. So first I'll, I'll, I'll give a little bit of context of um, what is ayahuasca and, and the history behind it. So ayahuasca is a word from the Quechua language commonly translated into English as vine of the soul. It um, refers to an Amazonian vine scientifically named uh, Bika Api and to also to a brew known um, by other names rather than ayahuasca. And, and these names belong actually to Amazonian indigenous people that use this medicine, which are around uh, 160 nations. And there are uh, many different names um, that, uh, with which they name it. And the brio is prepared according to different recipes as well, according to, to the group that is using it. But the most common is to mix Bika Api with P. virides, also known as Chacruna, and D. Cabrerena. Uh, but uh, in, this is uh, the plants that are mixed with the vine are the ones that contain DMT. And uh, ayahuasca use more recently has been associated with a range of positive therapeutic outcomes, including the alleviation of depression, and addictions. But um, again, there are many um, different recipes uh, for these different groups of indigenous people that use ayahuasca, and we, we are going to talk about it later as well. So I brought here um, a timeline that I prepared with the main historical facts about ayahuasca. Unfortunately, this is mainly based on what we have written about it. So the historical indigenous context is not very well represented here, but I think it's uh, also good to understand this history behind um, the medicine. So botanists have suggested that Bikapi probably emerged during the, the late Ice Age, and it is not possible to say when the practice of drinking ayahuasca originated, but there is archaeological evidence that suggests it um, use occurs since 2000 BC and the earliest written account of ayahuasca was done by Jesuit missionaries but for the most part their diabolical fears didn't allow the real easy entry into uh, western imagination 
and this uh, actually happened only uh, on mid uh, 1800s when botanist Richard Spruce and geographer Manuel Villavicencio experimented with the the brew themselves and described their cosmic journeys and here uh, is Spruce um, and here is actually a picture of his collection which is private on, on Kew Gardens and, and the description of Bika Api, which I uh, had the opportunity to uh, have access to while bringing some of the Huni Queen people from the Amazon to visit the, the, the collection in 2022. So during the rubber boom, indigenous cultures were almost exterminated by ayahuasca use didn't disappear different um, chemists started to name the active ingredient of ayahuasca until the, the alkaloid was first isolated in the 1920s. And then finally, in the late 30s, Chen and, and Chen published an article affirming that different compounds previous, previously identified were all the same as harmine. And it is the harming that makes it possible to DMT to be orally active. So um, also in, in the 40s, just after that, Brazilian uh, chemist Osvaldo Gonçalves extracted the DMT molecule from Mimosa Tenui Flora due to his experiences with the Pancaru indigenous people and their Jurema wine uh, and named it uh, nigerine discovering its psychedelic properties that were after recognized as a natural compound followed uh, following the self experiments of um hungarian psychiatry um stefan Zara, who actually got the credits for the discovery of its psychoactive properties instead of osvaldo and since the 60s, with the um, uh, spread of different ayahuasca religions around the world and with the works of um, different anthropologists and ethnobotanists, uh, Terence McKenna and, and especially Luis Eduardo Luna as well, uh, ayahuasca got really popular. And it was in Brazil during the 90s that the first study on health and safety of ayahuasca started and 20 years later, the Brazilian neuroscientists first um, scanned the brains of people drinking ayahuasca. And after then, ayahuasca became the subject of many studies that have been debated in different arenas, including the World Ayahuasca Conferences organized by uh, ICERS, um, but also uh, in reaction to, to that, the indigenous ayahuasca conference that happens since 2017 and it's going to happen now again next year in, in 25 and, and it's on the, the fifth edition and it happens in the Amazon just with indigenous peoples uh, from different groups where they actually come together to debate uh, different issues in relation to the use uh, of ayahuasca and the globalization of ayahuasca, especially in relation to the ethics of, of ayahuasca, of this use. And although being legal in many places, we now have what has been called the ayahuasca diaspora with many retreats happening uh, both in the forest and all around the world and being organized by indigenous and non-indigenous people uh, and we also have numerous uh, patents on DMT that have been filed, as well as different trials to study it in startups and pharmaceutical um, companies. And also the first medical grade uh, drug candidate of ayahuasca is, is being developed. So different um, scientific studies have triggered the race to patent innovative medications, vapes, beverages, and remedies that include the, the compounds of ayahuasca mixture. And here is um, just an example 
of, of some of them and, and also of uh, research that we are doing on patent and that uh, relate to ayahuasca and we will will now hopefully collaborate with Porta Sofia as well to refine this um, research. Um, but yeah, going, going back um, to who owns the, the knowledge of ayahuasca, that it's very important to this patent discussion. Um, I want to, to make a provocation and I'll go back to it here in terms of understanding knowledge as power as well. Uh, but yeah, this, this is something I, I'll, I'm going to show later. But to use a bit of the patent uh, language, the discovery of ayahuasca belongs to the different peoples of the Amazon basin. And there are various mixtures used by these peoples. Um, just to give an idea, for example, the different plants that can be added to the vine um, are now recognized to be more than 100 different species. Um, and, and there are different types of vines as well. And, and the main comp components of these mixtures are, um, again, the vine and the plants, but um, they're different ones. And the substances um, typically found in the vine are harmine, harmaline, and tetrahydroharmine, and in the plants is DMT, among others. Um, other substances. Harmine was identified for research purposes before the ayahuasca vine began to be scientifically studied. It was first identified in a flower called African rue and has since been, been used in antidepressant medications. Um, but DMT, uh, on the other hand, first appeared in the scientific context in, in a synthetic form when uh, Richard Mansk, uh, the German scientist who first synthesized it in 1931, was experimenting with alkaloid in, in his lab and then arrived at DMT. And at that time, the pharmacological and hallucinogenic potential of DMT was not studied. Then again, it was the Brazilian chemist and microbiologist Osvaldo Lima who discovered the occurrence of DMT in Mimosa Tenue Flora in 1946. Uh, and it was only in the 50s that the health and, and hallucinogenic potential of uh, DMT began to be studied, especially when the Hungarian chemist and psychiatrist Stefan Kizara started extracting DMT from the same uh, Mimosa to, to self-administer it intramuscularly. And afterward, research showed that DMT is present in different living beings, plants, and, and animals. So where does the main inventive nature of ayahuasca lie? Um, this is, in my view, is key for the point of patent disputes, because until science knew uh, ayahuasca better, uh, DMT, whether extracted from plants or synthesized, was only administered in three ways intravenously, intramuscularly, or smoked. And the possibility of using DMT orally was actually invented through the combination of ayahuasca. And this is uh, because our bodies have enzymes called MAOs, which are mitochondrial enzymes found in the liver and intestines, and, and they degrade the DMT molecule in the gastrointestinal tract. Um, when taken orally through oxidative deamination. And, and then it doesn't cause the psychoactive effect, making the presence of beta carbolines in the vine necessary for um, uh, as the uh, MAO inhibitors in, in their derivatives can make, then the, the, can break the, down the DMT and finally act to produce psychoactive uh, effects. And when MAO is inhibited, the EMT can access the circulatory and central nervous systems, producing the serotonergic effects that science has been um, studying so far. So going, going back to who holds the knowledge and, and to seeing knowledge as, as power, um, I want to refer here to Foucault's work uh, because uh, Foucault uses niche concept 
of genealogy in his studies of power and knowledge. Genealogy meaning uh, the need to look at the past to understand the present. And according to Foucault, there is a reciprocal relation between the production of, of knowledge and, and power. So um, interactions between knowledge and power produces truths and discourses that emerge as systems of thoughts composed of ideas, attitudes, forces of actions, beliefs, and practices that uh, construct the subjects and the worlds of which they speak. So we, uh, for example, as researchers, uh, we, are, we, are, we gain knowledge, we research practices in different areas, and on the other hand, that knowledge that is gained from these practices is produced for um, governing people in a more effective way, generating what Foucault calls techniques of uh, governance. So uh, just to give one example, when it, when it comes to knowledge and use of policies instruments, for example, one can, can equally discern this double process articulated by Foucault, um, where the wielding of power leads to new kinds of knowledge about a subject, about an individual, about uh, a medicine, about a group. Uh, and that knowledge is in turn used to refine these um, techniques of, of governance. And, and here I brought an, an example trying to show it in the case of ayahuasca. So here is like the, the scientific um, findings of, uh, about ayahuasca, naming, you know, adverse effects, the, the therapeutic benefits and, and so on. And, and sometimes it could uh, generate uh, a legislation, uh, and this is a uh, artificial intelligence uh, image, uh, but it may uh, become reality where, like, maybe ayahuasca is going to become legal for medical purposes and, and scientific research, but still illegal and restricted for the traditional indigenous um, use. Uh, so this exercise of power uh, is, is closely tied to the production of, of knowledge. Um, which again can can in turn sustain a discourse about what is good, what's bad, and and determine um, in the end what what is uh, shaped by this this policy and how it is shaped by the policies. And while looking at the genealogical roots and, and history of ayahuasca. Um, I found different interesting things, but one that called my attention was the fact that the search of what has been called green gold in, in, the, in the past centuries was one of the main forms of colonization that Amazonian indigenous groups have been subjected of. And, and this was done not just by researchers and, and botanists and, and so on, but by all European travelers uh, including missionaries, they were encouraged to search for plants at that time, which was actually what um, originated a boom uh, of uh, botanic gardens in, in Europe. So um, colonization and the appropriation of knowledge on plants is a great part of this history of power and, and, and knowledge. And, as mentioned, Richard Spruce was the first to classify Bicaapi taxonomically. He named the, the vine after the original Tucano name for it, which was Kaapi. Um, but another important fact in this history is why ayahuasca medicinal properties have not been further uh, studied um, at that time. And, and I, I, I follow what uh, Williams um, argued in, in terms of, of this gap in history because he, he uses the concept of agnotology to study culturally induced ignorance. He argues that this uh, cultural ignorance stems largely from a dominant European mindset normally associated with superiority that um, uh, uh, unable, uh, unable to, that was unable to comprehend or appreciate ayahuasca amongst the other plants that, that were explored at that time. And I wonder 
how how much of this story is repeating itself in the psychedelic field nowadays because uh, if we want to talk about ethics we need to analyze uh, this uh, uh, modern psychedelic practice as inserted in this history of colonization and modern medicine has embraced the potential of psychedelics for treating um, different disorders um, often without acknowledging their indigenous roots and while non-indigenous mainly uh, white uh, people dominant cultures adopt uh, these indigenous practices these communities actually become uh, sometimes even more alien alienated from their own uh, traditions and the associated medical benefits that these um, medicines have to offer even to them. And, and here I bring a quotation of Chief uh, Nishioka Yawanawa at the last psychedelic conference uh, last year where he, he highlights the argument of cultural ignorance and the narrow focus on the economic uh, potential, uh, potential of ayahuasca. He said, you, the scientists, will spend many years researching about these medicines, but if you do not understand the oranges of these mental health diseases, you, we, you continue to lose time. These illnesses are linked to everything that you, the white, the Western people are doing. I'm not against the science that you were doing with our sacred plants, but why you don't invite the true connoisseurs of these plants? What point we have arrived in this human ignorance? We are living in a new cycle, a new time of humanity, time of forgiveness, time of alliances, time for peace, time for love. Our human society is declining. If we do not review the concept of humanity, the future of humanity may not be long. We need to get together. We are with open arms for this new dialogue, this new discussion. But we, you are doing all this for the market, for your egos, for prizes. But only when you include us, you support us, you are healing the planet. We need to reconnect with our essence. So to me, he's invitation to change is, is very profound and and um I, I think it's like also calling for uh, what has been called the reparative justice and also i think it's important to to think um about colonization as um this indigenous economist we we wanna la duke uh reflects on um she she says that uh, colonization shares the same root as the word colon, which means to digest. And she explains that colonization is the process of digestion of one culture by another through military, economic, political, and religious mechanisms. And she argues that this pattern um, of being consumed is something we've witnessed throughout history and continue to see um today and in the case of psychedelic research on ayahuasca specific specifically a lot of the research being um done consider uh what actually happens in in the body in in the colon specifically uh like vomiting as uh, uh, and so on as adverse um, effects so um the the, the way scientific research see it is like this uh, uh, they could qualify it as adverse effects even the visions um like the, the 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 psychedelic visions are seen as adverse effects um and these are both like vomiting purging and the visions are actually crucial to indigenous people um so while for them most of the healing happens in the body uh modern science has been uh, limited to looking just at the brain and ignoring other other parts of the uh of the healing um spe especially the guts for example which is considered our other brain by many so how how to achieve ethics um, in this context? So uh, and this is again based on what we've been discussing in the group uh, and what has been discussed in the conferences as well. So there is uh, this urgent need 
to remedy social, economic, and political injustice stemming from the acknowledged, un unacknowledged imperial history of enslavement of both human and, and other than human beings, which continues to affect uh, the present. Um, and also to uh, try uh, to um, implement reparative justice in, in, in practice in the sense that we, we should aim to rebalance and to restore uh, a sense of personhood that has been systematically denied, serving as public acknowledgement of the, the harms endured. And reparations should uh, happen in both micro and in macro levels, and we propose an embodied uh, decolonization, an, an approach to decolonization that transcends the intellectual realm, encompassing all facets of um, existence, including physical, emotional, spiritual, and, and relational the dimensions. And, and this, um, this all should include proper uh, consultation and cultural re relevancy and reciprocity that goes beyond a, a, an exchange to actually repair the history uh, of centuries of colonization. So to, to achieve this, the indigenous groups at the Ayahuasca conference have been discussing, among other things, the construction of a code of ethics. Uh, and our indigenous uh, perspective, ethics are actually deeply rooted in spiritual connection and reciprocity with the natural world. And ethical responsibility begins with those who plant, harvest and prepare medicinal plants acknowledging their spiritual presence and, and role in the ecosystem. So this implies um, extending ethics to this, like uh, beyond human, uh, human beings to other than human beings. And indigenous knowledge views healing as holistic, integrating plants like ayahuasca into a broader cultural and spiritual um, systems. This contrasts with Western frameworks like the FDAs, which isolate chemical compounds and focus on measurable outcomes. Thus, while a medical grade ayahuasca pill may gain approval, traditional use could still face restrictions. So expanding the concepts of science and, and, and justice uh, requires recognizing indigenous knowledge and incorporating it into legal frameworks. This means moving beyond the narrow scientific assessments to include and protect cultural and spiritual practices, allowing indigenous communities to lead these discussions. Finally, ethical engagement must uh, address the underlying harm faced by indigenous populations, where rising suicide rates are tied to historical and ongoing violence, and more recently, the impacts of globalization. So addressing these issues is um, essential for a truly just and inclusive uh, approach. And although intellectual property is an alien concept to indigenous people, um, the belief of, of many of, of these uh, groups that use these sacred friends uh, is, is that the, they are actually gifts of the forest and as such do not belong to, to anyone. Um, but still the knowledge regarding their use do belong originally to the many groups that have been using them for many centuries. And because of, um, of that, we could talk about indigenous intellectual uh, property. And um, the, the um, WIPO, um, which is the, the World Intellectual Property Organization, defines in, uh, indigenous intellectual property uh, as this uh, uh, body of information, practices, beliefs, and philosophy that are unique um, to each in indigenous um, group. And uh, more, more recently, they also approved, uh, WIPO member states approved uh, this year, 
a new treaty uh, related to that uh, to intellectual property that ob oblige uh, oblige parties to disclose the indigenous peoples or local community who provided the traditional knowledge where the claimed invention in a patent application is based on um, and, and then to associate this knowledge and the genetic uh, resources to the people they originate uh, from. And in terms of protecting indigenous people's rights, uh, the main instrument that protects indigenous rights in relation to their traditional knowledge is the Convention for Biological Diversity and its Nagoya Protocol. Um, but countries like Canada and the United States, where most of the research related to ayahuasca is taking place, have not ratified the, the protocol. And one important thing it establishes is the creation of community protocols that can define rules for access and benefit sharing and can act as customary law to protect indigenous rights in, in relation to ayahuasca patents and misappropriation. And more recent, recently, um, as an outcome of the World Health Organization's uh, first global summit on traditional medicine in 2023, last year, the um, Guajara Declaration provides an important conceptual basis for connecting indigenous and modern health systems. In uh, Brazil, the only specific regulation concerning ayahuasca uh, is from the National System of Public Policies on Drugs, but it largely overlooks indigenous uh, people and just protects religious groups, prohibiting activities such as um, healing practices and, and tourism, which is now a great part of indigenous activities. So many pajés, many shamans who travel through share their medicines and knowledge view very unprotected and are sometimes subjected to unfair and unethical punishment. And there is also a process led by the same coalition of churches to recognize the use of ayahuasca in religious ceremonies as part of uh, Brazil's national cultural heritage, following the Peruvian example, but this process is still ongoing. And Finally, there is the biodiversity law that regulates benefit sharing and the use of traditional knowledge, but was uh, but it was actually called by many indigenous people as the biopiracy law, as um, it doesn't recognize the diversity of traditional knowledge and its collective ownership by multiple indigenous uh, groups. So um, here are some of the objectives that we are trying to achieve in, in this multidisciplinary group, basically related to the protection of indigenous rights and, and cultures, um, public drug policy uh, reforms, and, and also other, other issues. And, and here is also um, some, some of the actions that we are working on to, to implement, to achieve these objectives, especially important is the creation of a transboundary community protocol that could serve as a guideline for the use of ayahuasca and other sacred medicines. And this will be discussed in the next Indigenous Ayahuasca Conference in, in January and um, uh, the creation of the, the Code of Ethics. So uh, to conclude, I think uh, even with the, the poor regulation that we have in place for ayahuasca and, and the fact that it is uh, not legal in, in a lot of countries with few exceptions, we also know that it isn't illegal yet. What is illegal is actually DMT, that it's um, uh, one of the substances of ayahuasca. But with uh, the globalization of ayahuasca and its uh, use and some problems association associated with its misuse, there is a, a risk that ayahuasca can become um, illegal in the future, meaning that it could just be legal for biomedical use or even for uh, drug development and, and research, what would do a lot of harm uh, for indigenous people. And so in moving forward, it's very important to support indigenous people to keep their spiritual practices 
sacred because if shared, used and, and replicated with respect for original indigenous values and, and, and rights, they may help us to move beyond the dominant hegemonic uh, powerful and abusive systemic structures of power and knowledge that we live in. And, and for this, it is first important to recognize indigenous rights um, and knowledge. And, and also we, we wonder who, who is blind here and, and what is science? Because as indigenous peoples, um, they, they recognize themselves as great scientists. And the discovery of ayahuasca emerged not just as a gift from the forest, uh, but also as a result uh, for their uh, constant research and experimentation with these uh, plants. And it's then important to address the roots of colonial engagements with indigenous peoples. This requires a healthy confrontation of cultures that can be actually productive uh, and not just conflictive and, and, and can be uh, constructive as well, as it allows for articulating diverse knowledges, interests and, and motivations. And finally, to remember that uh, consensuses are processes, they are not predefined states, they are co-created. Um, so to, to finish and return to the question of who holds the, the power, and who reaps the, the benefits. I, I want to highlight a moment from one of the ayahuasca conferences um, where during a presentation on genetic rights, benefit sharing and the use of traditional knowledge, Moises Pianco from the Shaninka people of the Amazon, uh, he raised his hand and, and asked, would you sell your grandfather? Because uh, to us, ayahuasca is our grandfather. And this, uh, to me, this simple uh, yet very profound question underscores the fundamental difference in how indigenous communities perceive this uh, sacred medicine. Despite it being their knowledge and some could say their power, uh, indigenous peoples are often the last to be included in debates on the medicalization and commercialization of these medicines and they rarely receive the financial benefits from, from their commercialization. So hopefully there is a room to change this with ayahuasca and, and this is where we've been working hard uh, to do in, in this working group. Thank you uh, very much. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you so much, Fernanda. Um, if there's any questions, please drop those in the Q&A comment section. I don't think we have any questions. Uh, also, free, feel free to email us directly if you have any follow-up questions that come up, um, and then we'll forward those to Fernanda to, to help answer. Um, thank you so much, Fernanda. Thank you very much, Cici, for the invitation and the opportunity to talk um, in this seminar. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.